taken that program and with help from the HHMI expanded it to um, really try and engage those students more in research and um, get them involved in scientific careers. And that's something that's relatively new that started over about the last year or so, and I'll tell you how that's going. And then the other part of the talk that I'd, I'd like to discuss with you and hopefully get some feedback from you too is um, you know, how can we teach large classes better? This is an issue that's present on every university campus and there's a lot of work going into it. Um, I'm going to tell you about some of the experiments that we've tried to do actually this year even in our general chemistry courses um, and um, give you some idea about where that's going. But I think we're really a approaching this from a very experimental standpoint and we're not sure exactly um, you know, what's really going to work and what's not going to work. And I'll give you some opinions as to where we are with that, but I'd also love to hear about the type of things that you guys do and how you're thinking about this. I mean, it's my opinion that actually I think we're in a really transformative time for education. I think education, um, the way we educate at the college level, university level, is changing, and it's going to change more, and it's going to change faster, and it's going to change dramatically. And I think we all have this idea, or many people do, that, you know, technology can help us and that technology can allow us to teach better to larger numbers of students. Um, but I think that promise hasn't quite been realized yet and I'm not sure we really know how to do it well. Um, but it's there and it's going to happen and so um, I think um, we're going to see the way that, that, that um, teaching is done at colleges change a lot soon. Okay, so I'll start with um, this mentored learning program. Um, for groups underrepresented in, in, in biomedical research. And um, the motivation for this, I mean, there's many motivations for this, and they're all good ones. And um, it's something that Cornell is very interested in, is increasing diversity on campus. Um, there are social justice issues here. Um, but I think something that's worth mentioning is that ultimately, at least from an economic standpoint, this is a talent creation problem. And, if you're not drawing from large populations um, in your country, um, you're really, I think, missing out. And the bottom line is, is that groups that you traditionally think as being from underrepresented minorities are not going to be minorities for long, and that they're actually going to become uh, majorities. And so um, this is just some statistics, um, largely taken from studies done by the NSF. Um, saying that we're just not doing a good job of, of engaging people from these populations. Um, you know, soon what's known, typically known as underrepresented minorities, Hispanic, black students, um, they're, they're, they're not represented well in um, higher um, science um, training. And um, pretty soon if you um, look at what the population is, is going to be, that if we don't draw from these people, we're going to be at, at a huge disadvantage. So we have to be able to engage um, these groups. Um, so how I kind of got into this was when it was about 2007, 2008, and I was teaching our large course of um, freshman general chemistry, which is actually what I'm teaching this semester too, and it's a course of about 800 to 900 students. We have about 860 this year. And it's usually the first course that um, students take as freshmen. About one third of all the freshmen on campus take this course. And the bottom line is that unless it's, it's curved fairly low, it's curved to um, you know about a um, 2.8 GPA. That's the mean in this course. So half the kids are going to get that or lower in their first major course at Cornell. And so if they don't do well, it can really be a, a place where they sort of fall off um, the progression to a science-based career right from the beginning. And um, this is exactly what was happening. And I'll show you some statistics for that in a little bit. So what was done is um, students were identified that um, perhaps were not doing well because they just didn't have the preparation for it. And um, this was all done by through Cornell and had, had nothing to do with me in the beginning. And they were put in something called a pre-freshman summer program, which is essentially a boot camp type program in the summer before they come in their freshman year to try and get them up to speed. And the way that these students are identified, it actually depends on the college. The college, different colleges classify them differently. But generally, they are students who come from either very urban high schools or very rural high schools, um, are first generation college students in their families. 
Um, there's uh, calculations of what net family income um, is, and then uh, things like SAT scores are also looked at. And that's generally how these students are identified, and they're called priority students, and there can be um, a couple of hundred of them in our incoming freshman classes. Um, and so this pre-freshman summer program, at least from our perspective in general chemistry, really wasn't working very well, and it really wasn't helping these kids. And so at the time, um, I was teaching uh, this, the, the general course, and then a, a colleague of mine, Stephen Lee, who is also a professor in our, in our department, uh, who has put a tremendous amount of effort into this, was teaching another um, flavor of freshman chemistry, and at the same time, and having sort of the same problems. And so we decided to sort of take a look at this course and see um, you know, what was going on, and, and, and you know, is there anything that we could do to make it better? Um, and so what we saw, to sort of sum it up, was that this course was not being run by the chemistry department. It was being run by the Learning Strategy Center at Cornell, which is sort of a wide campus um, um, learning um, department. And they were doing something very reasonable. What they were trying to do was to teach these kids chemistry before they would take chemistry. Um, sort of like an, a, a, a refresher of high school chemistry. And they were doing that in other subjects as well. Um, and that was just not proving to be very effective. And when we looked into it, the reason was is that the, the kids just weren't at the position to absorb that. And what we realized is, is what they really lacked, I think, was um, a lot of basic quantitative reasoning skills. And it's simple to say, well, it's just math. It's not necessarily just math. It's more, I think, about reasoning in a quantitative way. And so what we tried to do was to develop a different freshman incoming program that focused more on developing quantitative skills that would be more widely applicable I think, in science and science. And so that actually turned out to be fairly successful. And I'll, sh I'll show you some of the results of that. Um, I mentioned Yuri Treisman here, who was um, originally oops, at uh, oops, at, um, at Texas and, and really <coughs> developed sort of peer-led um, small workshop tape based methods for teaching kids calculus. And some of you may have heard of him. Um, his methods have, I think, proven in many contexts to be very successful and they involve getting together kids in small groups, um, really focusing on problem solving. That's the way to teach is by working through problems, doing examples. And the other important component to this is that it's peer-led. And so generally, these small groups have um, someone who is an advanced student in there who is similar to the types of students that are working, someone who can relate to them well, can communicate with them well, and can guide them through the problem-solving exercises. And that turns out to be a really effective formula. The other thing is, is that it just takes a lot of time. And I'll try and show you some of the data on this. Um, you don't get something for nothing. If you want to improve outcomes, um, you got it. the kids have to invest a lot of time and a lot of work. And um, if they do that, um, things, things can, can improve. All right, so that's sort of what I said before. Um, this is um, sort of classic Bloom's taxonomy of, of, of different reasoning skills. And the idea here <coughs> is that there's a pyramid and that first you have to establish these basic cognitive skills, and then up, on upon them you can kind of build higher cognitive skills. And we sort of correlated you know, what we think about the grades in, in general chemistry are to these different levels of the pyramid. And you know, to get a C in general chemistry, all you have to do is remember stuff. Um, if you want to get a B, you actually have to understand a little bit about what you're remembering. And if you want to get an A, you have to actually apply it to things that you haven't seen before. These higher level skills, I mean, I think actually these are the things we try and develop in graduate students. Um, and you know, this one up at the top, I still struggle with myself. So um, you, know, you, have to, you, you have to always be working on this, I think, no matter who you are. OK, so this is um, what I'll call sort of the stage one of this program. And typically, we have something like 60 students in it. We actually had more like 80 this past summer. But that's, that's sort of the, the, the number. Um, and um, it's a very problem set driven process. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how much time the, the kids put into it in, in a minute. Um, there, you can go to this website if you like. That's Stephen's website where he has examples of a lot of the problem sets that he uses. And you're welcome to take those and work with them if you like. 
Um, group work is important. Um, we do a lot of sort of oral drilling sessions, and what this is 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 really asking kids to respond to questions in an interactive way. And um, we've likened it to, to learning a language, and, and essentially that's what these kids are trying to do, is they're trying to learn a language. And the only way you're gonna learn it is if you practice it, and if you practice it in a, in a way where you get sort of instant feedback. Um, I remember when my son, who was, uh, my wife is French, and my oldest son, um, we went to France during my first sabbatical, and he was in grade one at the time, and we just put him into French public schools. He didn't speak a word of French. Um, and um, he picked up the language pretty quickly, a lot more faster than, than me, that's for sure. And um, it was amazing to watch him on the playground, actually, because when he was around the other kids, um, you know, he was just trying to communicate with those kids. He was just throwing out sounds, just throwing out words, and he was getting feedback all the time. And then, you know, there was this reinforcement that whatever worked, worked, and it stuck. And as an adults, we just don't, we don't learn that way. And so that was some of the motivation for doing this, is, is really getting, they can't just sit back and contemplate things. They really have to try and in real time express ideas. And um, we, we find that that's actually very useful. Um, we do a lot of testing. Um, and that's sort of built into the framework of these programs where we're constantly evaluating the kids. And what that does is I think it teaches the kids to evaluate themselves because that's one of the key things is being able to recognize what you don't understand. And um, I think when the students come in, they're very poor at that. You know, how many times have you heard someone come to you after you know, writing one of your exams saying, gee, you know, I studied, I thought I knew everything, and I got into the exam, and I didn't know anything, I couldn't do anything. And so this ability to self-evaluate is something that it's not easy to instill, but one way you can do it is just ex having them experience evaluation quite often. Um, and um, yeah, the, the hours are important. So we have this minimum of four hours per week, and I'll say a little bit more about that as, as we go forward. Okay, so and then there's the old joke of how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Well, you have to practice, and I think that's really the bottom line, is, is, is you have to work at it. Um, this is just an example of, of the types of questions that we start with, and so we're not just teaching, trying to teach them chemistry, but we're trying to teach them to reason, and one of the ways, a fun way to do that is to give them sort of puzzles um, and um, logic um, exercises, and you know, here's an example of, of some of the things that we work on with these kids. And uh, when they come in, and, and it's amazing, you know, when you can give somebody something like this, and then um, when you see that they actually understand it and they realize what looks like a really complicated thing is actually a simple problem, and you can really see the lights go off in their eyes um, when that happens. And so you, you just have to kind of, you know, sort of throw that, that line to them. And then, um, you know, the kids are extremely hardworking, and um, they have tremendous potential. And, if you can create a structure for them to succeed in, um, they usually just lap it up. And they, they do great. So here's some data. Um, this was 2008. So this was, um, these are the priority kids here in blue. This is the class mean as a whole for, this was my fall 2008 um, general chemistry final. And you can see that um, the priority students are really, you know, they're far below the mean. So if you think this mean here, is um, you know essentially a B minus. They're all getting lower than a B minus, and so that was really derailing for them. This is the 2013 um, after being through um, the new PSP summer program, and now and this is fairly consistent. I'll show you some other more recent data too that um, th they largely match the distribution that we see from the from the student body as a whole. Now, one interesting thing is is that this is a broad distribution, and so that's telling you already that the type of students that you have in these large classes is incredibly diverse, and that creates challenges in itself. And you still have that diversity in the, the summer students, but at least now, um, it seems like the distributions match more, more readily. Um, so the, the 2008, now was the students who have this um, learning strategy approach in the summer? Yeah, so that was sort of like remedial chemistry. That was, the, that was the remedial high school chemistry approach. Um, and I mean, that, and it, it was not just 2008, it was the years before as well, but that, that was sort of the result, that is where they'd end up. And then if you kind of move away from that and you try and focus more 
on um, the quantitative aspects and also change the way the teaching is done. Um, these are the improvements we're seeing. And with 2013, was that the first year that you? Let, let me show you, I'll show you. How, so on the next slide here, um, so this is, we sort of started doing this in 2008. And um, this is a graph for, um, these are the DF and withdrawal. So these are essentially the failing grades. And this in blue are the, is the students who are in the summer course. And these are students who are from the same pool of students, but they're not in the summer course. The summer course is voluntary, so they don't all take the summer course. So we actually have a bit of a control group there. And so what you can see, so this is, these are the failing grades, and then these are the A grades. And then um, this is the entire class average in red here. So we were able to get rid of the failing grades fairly quickly. Um, and, but if you look at the kids who are really excelling, it's only in the last few years where we've been able to get them up into the, um, into the a, a, a range. And the reason that is is that we hope, at least, that we've, we've been changing and we've been improving the way that we do things. And so I think we're better now at, 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 at um, training them than we were in, in 2010. And are probably the interventions all taking place in the summer before, or are there also interventions that continue during the academic year? So that's new, um, actually starting last year and in a major way this year, where we've, and that was sort of the second part of what I was, I was going to tell you about is that we've tried to take these methods and make them available to any student that, that teaches that takes Chem 2070. And last year we had um, about 30 students, and this year we have about 150 um, in that course. And I'll show you what. So, so that's that's an. So, so my final is actually a week tomorrow. So we don't quite know the data that's in for the fall, this fall, where we have 150 kids um, that are. Uh, basically self-selected to take that course. It was offered to everybody. And so we don't quite know what the outcome is yet, but I can show you at least what some of the results from the prelims have been. So, 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 so the students are self-selected, how many of those are just general nerds who just love chemistry and want to do all chemistry possible? Or are there some that are more specialized and want to do all the chemistry possible? Versus students who are not in the high-risk group but at some risk. Uh, do you know those data yet? Um, we know a little bit of it, so it's a little bit bimodal. Um, so in the for, so for the for the pre-summer program, um, you know, even there, you, I mean, if you go back to this, I mean, you definitely have a distribution. So you have some high-end students, and there is some self-selection here because um, the students aren't forced necessarily to go in this. Um, in there's more self-selection, I would say, in the course that's running right now in parallel and. You do, be, you do see a bit of a bimodal distribution, I believe, where you have some kids who just want to do everything, right? So right. those kids are, but, but what I will say is that it's pretty time consuming. So I think that the students that don't really need it learn quickly that you know, they might be able to spend their time better elsewhere. Um, but you know, how do you get the right students in there is a very interesting question. And then another thing that comes up um, is a question of fairness, because if you actually start moving the curve on those kids that are taking this um, parallel course. Um, it's a two-credit um, uh, pass-fail course. Um, but what you're kind of doing is you're turning freshman chemistry from a four-credit course to a six-credit course for those kids. And what they get out of it is they get presumably a higher grade. Is that fair to the kids who don't take it? Um, and so that becomes an issue um, when you start getting a large proportion of kids in there. And that's something that we're grappling with, and we don't really have a good answer for. Um, so, okay, let me. There was one. There was another yeah, question in the back. Yeah, another question. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, if you use guys, is the extra credit for participating in this in the uh, group work section, the field work section? Is that what you said? There is extra is credit. Four versus six. Seven, yeah, they get two. They get two two real credits um, for doing the extra. Course, the parallel course. But they don't get anything to affect their grade in chemistry other than the exams. Um, to affect their so, grade. So the assignments in general chemistry are the same whether you're in the workshop or Absolutely. not. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the same course. A actually, we, what we've tried to do um, is to decouple it as much as we can so that um, 
again, we, we don't try to teach right to freshman chemistry. So it's supposed to be a course to help. We, we call it um, quantitative reasoning for the physical sciences. And although there is certainly some chemistry in it, um, you know, it, it also <coughs> sort of stresses these other more basic skills and it doesn't follow the topics of, of general chemistry and sequence and things like that. So, yeah. So you said that's two credits pass fail. It so is. So you could take that for bio or physics or any? Anybody could take it for, it does, you don't have to be taking chemistry, anyone can take it. Um, and we were just talking to the, actually the, the advisors in the ag, ag college, so Cornell has various colleges and the ag college contributes about 50% of the kids to general chemistry. And they, um, and interestingly, if you look at their grades compared to say the kids in the College of Arts and Sciences, they're almost a full letter grade below on average. And so their advisors are now, um, and all the colleges at Cornell have different admissions criteria and so on, um, are now gonna recommend that their kids take the parallel course, which is great except for the fact that we don't know how we're going to ever um, you know, handle, handle 500 kids. I mean, we, we can handle, We've handled 150, we think we can probably handle 300. Um, I don't know if we can handle 500. Um, but actually, let me, since we're talking about that, why don't I jump ahead to that? So what happens to the students who fail that? Fail that course? Yeah. Um, so the only way you can really sort of fail that course um, is to not go to it. Um, and let me show you, we have some interesting data there. and so. I mean, we're not really too concerned about, the truth of the matter is, no Cornell student really needs those two credits. I mean, they're not that important to them. So, um, you know, it's really a question of, of being something, an incentive to get them to go. Um, so, so we've experimented with some things in general chemistry this year, and that's what I was gonna talk about here. But let's talk about this um, course. So we, we call it 1070. Our, our general chemistry course is called 2070, and um, this, this introduction uh, is called 1070. And so, um, so this is what we've been able to do. It, it sort of parallels the, the, the summer program. It uses some, some of the same materials and some of the same <coughs> teaching methods to do that. Um, our first year, which was last year, we had about 30 students in it. And um, this year we have about 150. Um, we can get them in two one and a half hour problem solving sessions a week. Um, and it's peer led and it's interactive and it's, um, you know, small group where there's about, I would say, let's see, there's probably six, probably about 18 students in a classroom when we break them up into three groups and each group gets a TA um, to work with them. And the TAs are all undergraduate TAs. They're generally um, students who had taken the course. Um, they're usually either sophomore, junior, some, some seniors. And um, we do a lot of work in training the TAs. So trying to, I mean, we almost teach another course in just training the TAs to, to have them um, um, be effective at, at, at mediating these groups. Um, so that's sort of what the structure that it has. Um, so this is comparing, this is uh, the second prelim of this fall, and in red is the class as a whole distribution, and in blue are the kids who are involved, who are enrolled in the 1070 course. So um, they're definitely skewed towards towards the high end. But again, this is, this is self-selecting, so you do have some kids in here who are, who are, you know, towards the high end of the scale, for sure. I would think... Is this 1070 course only open to participants in the PSB program? Everybody. Anybody who wants to take it. And some of the kids who are in the PSB program do take this, too. They follow through. Actually, a lot of them do. Um, but, um, yeah, we're now drawing kids from, from any, any, any Cornell student. This is available to I mean, uh, the ideal would be to have a system that just works for everybody, right? That, that's kind of what you would love to have. It's just something that everyone can go into and has the, the, the means there to, to, to fulfill their potential. Uh, the question is important. I mean, it would be interesting to see the blue bars split up in the two groups, right? Yeah. So, so something that you run into with doing these things is, you know, the control experiments are really hard to do. And the other thing that, that you run into, which is a logistical issue, is that you can't always get the data that you want to get. So it's remarkably hard to get data from the register on students. That they don't like to give that up. And so you have to make really compelling cases. We actually just hired a statistician um, this year to help us analyzing some of this stuff. And we're doing, we're trying to, to, 
we're trying to use some self-reporting to get a little bit around these things. So for example, um, at the end of, of this year's class, we're, we're having them fill out in their laboratory a more extended questionnaire where we ask them things like, you know, did you take this course, did you take that course? And we ask them to self-report their prelim scores so that we can correlate and actually have ask them to self-report some of their admissions um, criteria too, telling them that, you know, this is voluntary. But if we can get them to do that, it means that it's, a much, it's going to be much easier for us to access data and correlate, um, correlate things. Um, so, right, so then, some other, I have some other things here. So, um, so let's see, this is, um, so here, <coughs> these are the students that are in 1070, and then, So here, what we have, again, this is the distribution. This is, again, the same prelim, so it's just one test. Um, but in blue, what you have are, these are the, the priorities.